Welcome to the Materials and Fuels Complex. Originally known as Argonne National Laboratory West, this facility was operated by the University of Chicago until February 1st of 2005. At that point, all of the facilities here became part of the Idaho National Laboratory. What is housed here are a number of facilities integral to the United States nuclear renaissance. The fuel conditioning facility, the hot fuels examination facility, fuel manufacturing facility, all of these will play into the INL's role in developing the next generation of nuclear power for the United States. In addition to that, we sponsor NASA's work with the Space and Security Power Systems Facility doing final assembly and testing of batteries, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, that NASA uses on deep space probes. Let's go take a look at the fuel conditioning facility. One of the most distinctive facilities at the Materials and Fuels Complex is Experimental Breeder Reactor 2, the large silver dome in the center of the, the facility. On the diagram beside me, it shows Experimental Breeder Reactor 2. It operated from 1964 through September 30th of 94 very successfully. Adjacent to Experimental Breeder Reactor 2 is the Fuels Conditioning Facility, FCF which was co-located with EBR2 to, in the early days, prove that they could recycle fuel directly from a reactor through a reprocessing mission and back into the reactor. Today, FCF serves as a research facility supporting both the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, the Advanced Fuel Cycle Initiative, and in looking at a way to, in a proliferation-resistant manner, reprocess spent nuclear fuel. That is what is done here at the fuel conditioning facility. In the diagram it shows both an air cell and an argon cell. The argon cell simply because the experimental breeder reactor 2 fuel was sodium bonded and to expose sodium to oxygen is not a good thing so all of the work done with the fuel is in the argon atmosphere cell. Let's go take a look at that now. As opposed to what you saw at ATR with the use of fuel elements, EBR2 made the use of fuel pins, relatively long, slender, thin pins that had 13 and a half inches of enriched uranium inside. In this portion of the hot cell, it is filled with argon gas. The fuel pins are segmented into quarter inch chunks. And at the station behind me, they are then loaded into what's known as an anode basket to move on to the electro refiner to extract any unused uranium out of the spent fuel. At this window is really the heart of the research here on how to reprocess fuel. Behind this window, behind five feet of leaded glass and mineral oil, is the electro refiner, which is full of molten salts, lithium chloride and potassium chloride, at 500 degrees C. And it has been at that temperature since 1996. This is where the basket of chopped fuel from EBR2 is placed into the electro refiner and then electrochemically they extract out the unused uranium and recover that, leaving behind all of the fission products as well as the plutonium and the other actinides that right now as a nation we don't recover. There have been now three times under the Advanced Fuel Cycle Initiative funding to prove that we can recover plutonium and other actinides in a bulk recovery, a proliferation resistant way, which is great fuel for a fast reactor and useless for a weapon. So this research is taking place in this cell, proving that we can safely recover those materials and not put them in a repository for thousands of years. To my right is a photograph of what the uranium looks like as it comes out of the electro refiner, a fairly dendritic looking formation that does carry over some of the salts from the electro refiner. That is scraped off into a graphite crucible, loaded into what's called the cathode processor, which is not easy to see because instead of being located in front of a window, it's between two sets of windows. Suffice it to say, the cathode processor heats the uranium up boils off the salts that are carried over, which are collected in the bottom, put back in the electro refiner. They now have an ingot of uranium metal recovered from the fuel. There's only one other step beyond this. It is melted again in a casting furnace. More uranium-238, depleted uranium, is added to it, and they make a very nice ingot of uranium that has been recovered from the spent fuel, which we now store on site, awaiting the Department of Energy to decide what to do with it. Our responsibility is to keep it here, keep it safe, and it is available for use in another reactor just about anywhere else in the country. 
The tools of the trade for the operators at both the fuel conditioning facility and the hot fuel examination facility are the manipulators. On my left, this is a, a lighter weight manipulator, which has a, a thumb and forefinger grip that allows the operator to pick up about 20 pounds or so. Behind me, there is a heavier grip that allows them to pick up up to 50 pounds of weight. Also inside the cell, there are, there are electromechanical arms that allow them to pick up up to 750 pounds, as well as overhead cranes that allow them to pick up objects up to five tons to move them around inside the cell. And it is definitely a very learned skill that these operators possess. At the fuel conditioning facility, we saw a, a fairly single purpose hot cell dealing with spent nuclear fuel and recycling research. Here at the hot fuel examination facility, they have a number of different customers from the Department of Energy to commercial customers and even other countries that come here to do work in this very unique hot cell. At the portion I'm standing at now, similar to FCF, it is an argon atmosphere cell, an inert atmosphere, allowing them to handle a number of different materials very safely. At the other end of the cell, similar to FCF, an air cell for decontamination work with six workstations there. On the side of the cell I'm standing at now, this is a lot in support of the fuel research that's going on now on different waste forms. The opposite side of the cell is where a number of the other customers come to do work on post-radiation examination, to look at material that has been in a nuclear environment remotely, study it, and learn from it. Additionally, here in the basement of the hot fuel examination facility is one of the three operating reactors on the INL, the neutron radiography reactor, which allows them to take neutron radiographs of radioactive material, very similar to an X-ray, but instead of using X-rays, they're using neutrons from this very small reactor, a very unique capability for the United States. Behind me, this very nondescript looking building, also behind the double security fence, is the Space and Security Power System Facility. It may not look like much from here, but the work that takes place inside the building is amazing. Here at the INL, we take all of the components for space batteries, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, RTGs, and assemble those components for NASA for deep space probes to power those missions. So far we've made one battery, it's currently on its way to Pluto, and here in another seven or eight years when we finally get data from that space probe, we can proudly say that that battery was made in Idaho at the INL. They're gearing up now for the NASA's next mission, another rover to go to Mars, and we're very proud of the work that takes place here. <music>